Lady, you have a seat. Thank you, ladies. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 9. I mean, Mark chapter 9, you just put your finger there. And if you don't, it's fine. We, we have the words on the screen. Uh, last week, we talked about why we pray. Like, why do we even do it? And uh, to, to answer that question, we looked at the life of Jesus. And we kind of went through the, the reasons that Jesus prayed. One was he had a close relationship with God the Father. And so the people that you have a close relationship with, the people that you talk to all the time, right? If you never talk to them, the relationship's probably not that close to begin with. So, so we pray because we want a close relationship with the Father. The second thing is the reason Jesus prayed was he prayed because he wanted to know what Dad was up to. Right? He prayed so he could see what God was doing. And we do the same thing. That's one of the reasons we pray, so we know what God is up to in the world, and so that we can join in with what he's doing. And the third thing we saw that Jesus actually prayed so he could deal with stress. There was times in Jesus' life, even though he was fully God, we got to remember he was fully man, and he was stressed. And so he went to the Father to pray when he was stressed. And, and the final reason we looked at was that Jesus went to pray to God so he could get direction for his life. Like Jesus prayed right before he chose the 12 apostles. He prayed all night long leading up to that big decision. And so those are some of the reasons why we pray. Now, today we're going to begin looking at how we pray. Now, last week at the end, I kind of gave you a little teaser about how we're going to pray. I challenge you to do this. I challenge, you, I challenge each of you just to take a couple minutes each day and to pray. Like, give God your whole focus. Not, not praying while you're in the shower, not, which is fine. That's great. I pray a lot in the shower. Not praying while you're driving your car, which is fine. I do that, too, just as long as you don't you know, get tunnel vision or run a stop sign. I've done that before. Um, uh, that didn't hit anyone, but it's happened. Uh, you know, I, not necessarily just doing it here or there, but taking a couple minutes each day and giving God all your attention. Now, how did it go? You know, how, you can answer out loud if you want, but how did it go? Some days were really good for me this week, and there's some days where it's kind of like, yeah, I really didn't do that. Like, I'm just going to be real with you, okay? It's, it's okay. But, but I did notice an awareness this week as I, as I really tried hard to give God my undivided attention. And so as we look about how we pray, you know, one of the things I think about before we talk about how we pray, as I think about there's lots of reasons we neglect to pray, right? Like sometimes there's busyness in our lives. So we, I, I'm just too busy to pray. And we talked about this when we first started. Sometimes there's stress. Like, man, I'm just too stressed to pray. There's exhaustion, right? You're just exhausted. You're too tired. Every time I close my eyes to pray, you know, I fall asleep, right? Anyone ever done that? I've definitely done that. That's one of my things that I do. Um, but yeah, have you ever tried this? Have you ever thought about praying with your eyes wide open? Sometimes, like, we're not taught to do that, but there's nothing wrong with playing, praying with your eyes wide open. I mean, I don't see in the Bible where it says, bow your heads and close your eyes. Like, we do that here, but I don't really see it in the Bible anywhere, right? Sometimes we don't pray because it just seems unproductive. Like, man, I got more important things to do than to take my time to talk to a God that I can't see and I can't hear. Right? So because we can't see God and because we can't audibly hear him the way you're hearing my voice right now, we just say, I don't really think that there's any fruit that's going to come out of this. It's better if I just go on about my day and try to do whatever I need to do, fix my own problems. The list goes on and on and on. But I think one of the biggest reasons that we don't pray is because of pride. We think we can or should be able to do it ourselves. Like there's a little bit of, man, I'm a grown person. I shouldn't have to go to God and ask him for his help at this point. Like I should be able to do this. Why should I bother God? God's got bigger things to do than worry about me. That's kind of the opposite of pride, but it's the same thing. It's like a, it's like a false humility. It's just an excuse we use. You know, I'm less of a man if I have to pray, or I'm not a strong, independent woman if I pray. It's the American way, after all, right, to be independent, to be self-made. I shouldn't have to pray. I should just work hard and pick myself up by my bootstraps. That's, that's the American way. But as we look at how we pray, we see that nothing could actually be any further from the truth. We need to learn to be helpless when we pray. In fact, that's the title of the sermon is Learning to Be Helpless. That's the first step in how we pray. We pray as if we're helpless. 
Well, there are times in each of our lives we feel helpless, helpless. Most of us don't like to admit it, right? We don't like to admit that we can't help ourselves. We don't like to admit that, man, there's something that I can't do, right? And I, I don't know. I can't speak for ladies because I've never been a lady. But I know <laughs> growing up, that was a big thing for guys, right? Like, as a kid, as a man, you know, growing up young, like, I felt like I had to be do it all because I was a man. I don't, I know that's misogynistic. I'm not saying that's the way it is. I'm just saying that's, that was kind of the idea, right? You grow up, be a man. Like, you ever heard someone say that, be a man? Like, that was the way it was. And, man, if I couldn't be a man and do it all on my own, man, I didn't want to admit that. I just wanted to slink away and hide. A lot of us were taught to keep a stiff upper lip, right? Excuse me keep a stiff upper lip, and that we can just push through, and that's fine. But when it comes to God, he's looking for us to let our guard down. He wants us just to be real and vulnerable and honest when we come before him. In fact, it may be difficult for us to recognize when we feel helpless, but we usually say stuff like this. Like, when you're, you're, we're all helpless at some point, right? Whether we want to admit it or not, like, we say stuff like, I can't anymore. Anyone ever say that? I just can't. Like, I'm just, I'm done. I can't. We say stuff like, life is hard. We ask questions like, is it all worth it? What's the point? We say, I'm done. I don't understand. Why bother? I give up. Will it ever get better? Anyone ever ask that one? Like, that's, will it ever get better? Will I ever get past this? Why can't things ever go my way. Just why not? Just once. Just once. Why can't it go my way? It goes good for all these other people, and these other people aren't even trying to do what's right. But why can't it go my way just this once? And these are all things that we begin to think when we really begin to feel helpless. And we realize at this moment that we can't do our own. These are all the feelings that God wants us to bring to Him in prayer. Like we talked about at the beginning of the year, these feelings may be rubble strips. You know, we, we talked about how the highway, you know, the Department of Transportation installed the rubble strips on the shoulders of the highway. So if you start to run off the road, what's it do? It jostles you, it gets your attention, it wakes you up if you're dozing at the wheel so you won't run off the road and hit a tree and have a wreck or cause damage to your car or damage to yourself. And, and sometimes I think when we start to feel helpless, you know, we think, man, I just got to pull myself together and push through it. And God's saying, no, this is a rumble strip. I'm trying to get your attention. I want you to bring your helplessness to me. I want you to start to talk to me just a little bit more. I want your attention, and I want to talk to you. There's an interesting interaction that takes place in the book of Mark that I think kind of illustrates what happens when our helplessness intersects with God's power. So I'm going to read Mark chapter 9. Verse 14, if you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there if it's on your phone or whatever, uh, or we have the words on the screen. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. It says this, when the disciples, when they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw him talking about Jesus, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with him about? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. He replied to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it's thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can't do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit... I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out shrieking and throwing him into terrible convulsions. The boy became like a corpse, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. 
After he had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told him, this kind can only come out by, can come out by nothing but prayer. I'm sorry I get choked up. My, uh, he's not here today, but my oldest son is, uh, is mute for the most part. Uh, he, he can't really talk and communicate. And so I get emotional when I think about what God can do. And I think about the prayers that we've had and that haven't been answered the way that I want them to be answered. You know, I've prayed and asked God to let my son talk. He's 15. I don't know. You know, he may never have a girlfriend. He may never have a wife. He can't talk. He's intellectually delayed. And I think about, I look at this father and I just kind of feel the helplessness that this father feels. And I understand what it is to come to God and you don't necessarily get what you want. And that's a hard thing. Like, how do you reconcile that in your life? I didn't even plan on saying this. I'm sorry. I just, I don't know. I got emotional at the moment. So I'm, I'm just being real with you. Come on. How do you reconcile that though? And, and here's the first thing. Here's the first point. God sees our helplessness. God sees our helplessness. Look at verses 14 through 18 again. When he came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the scribes disputing with them. So here's the scene. Jesus and, uh, and a few of the disciples just coming down from, from a mountain where like some crazy stuff happened. I won't get into all to it right now. But they come down and they see the other disciples there and they're having an argument with the scribes. And the scribes were like these powerful religious leaders of the day. They knew everything back and forth. And these disciples were just like, they were just fishermen. And they're arguing against these guys that are basically lawyers. And so they're kind of outmatched, right? Like on the, on the educational scale, what business do they have getting into an a, a argument with them, a battle of the wits with them, as it were? And so Jesus comes down, and he sees them doing that. And, and it says, when the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with him about? And someone from the crowd answered them, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whatever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes, rig becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. So Jesus walks in on the scene, and he sees what's happening. This man was helpless when it came to his son. All he wanted was for his son to be well. And the man said, man, there is nothing that I can do. I've tried it all. And I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know where to go. And I know these guys follow you, and there's, there's rumors and stories about all the things that they can do in your name about what you do, so I brought them to them. And what happened? What did the disciples The disciples couldn't do anything either. Like the man's helpless, so he brought his son to the disciples, and the disciples are helpless because they couldn't do anything either. Like, I, I don't know. I got nothing for you, man. I don't know what to do. You know, I, I remember... When the kids were little, um, Eva was, who's our youngest daughter, she was just a little, she was just crawling around. Like, she wasn't even walking. Yet. Just toddler, newborn, crawling around. And Hunter was, I don't know, I don't know what the difference in age is. Four years apart. They're about four years apart. So Hunter was probably five, and Eva was probably not quite one or somewhere around there. And um, I was watching this one. They were in the house, and Hunter was trying to get something up on the counter. And he couldn't quite reach it. And he kind of looked around, and there was nothing there but Eva. And so he picks up Eva, and he drags Eva up beside the counter, and he sets her there, and he steps up on her back to try to reach up. Now, Eva collapses under the weight of Hunter because he's quite a bit larger. And what does he do? Every time she collapses, he picks her up, puts her on her hands and knees, and steps up, and she collapses again. And he picks her up, sets her up, doesn't get it, she collapses. And then he starts getting mad. Like, he can't really talk, but he starts... Ah, and he starts yelling and getting mad. And, and finally, she like whips holes the weight and he gets what he wants and they're all happy. And, and so I'm just kind of watching the scene play out like all good fathers do. Like, why would I ever stop something so wonderful? Like, you know, like, I just like, Christy, come here, watch this. You know, he's trying for like the eighth time. She's still not holding up. She doesn't know what he's trying to do. And so I'm watching all this happen. And, you know, I just kind of realized how helpless Eva is in that moment. She's a, she's a baby. She's an infant. She has no idea what's going on, right? She's just minding her own business, you know, slobbering all over something. And, and here Hunter comes 
to, to make her a footstool they could stand up on and reach something on the counter, probably a, a piece of candy or a drink or something like that. And there's nothing that she could do about it. And you know, that's really the way that God wants us to come to him. There's no need for us to play games with God. We don't have to put on an act or be embarrassed to come to him. It's okay to be helpless like Eva was helpless. It's okay just to be sitting there and taking the beating and be like, okay, God, like, I don't know how to get out of this. It's just kind of happening. And I don't know where to go and I, I don't know what to do. I think most of us have experienced a moment. You ever had a moment in your life where like you had a friend who was going through something and you could have helped, but you only find out after the fact that you could have helped? Does that make sense? Like you ever have you let me put it this way. Have you ever told someone, I wish you would have asked me? I wish you would have come to me. I wish you would have let me know. Because I would have loved to have been there for you. I would have loved to have listened to you. I would have loved to help you out with whatever it is you need to help. I think most of us have probably experienced that. We've probably been on both sides of that conversation, right? Where someone says, man, I wish I would have known. You should have let me know. I would have helped you out. Or we've been the one to say, you should have let me know. You know, either way, we've done that. And I think God longs for us to ask. You're not putting God out by coming to him. He already sees our helplessness. He knows, just like I'm sitting there watching Eva and Hunter go through this. You know, Hunter's helpless too. He can't totally reach the thing. He needs someone to come alongside him and help him. And Eva's helpless to get out of the situation that she was in. And God looks at the whole picture and he sees our helplessness. And unlike me, he's not just going to let it happen. Right? He's going to intervene if we ask him. He wants us to come to him. He sees our helplessness. And he's ready for us to see it too. So the first thing is God sees our helplessness. The second thing is this. Helplessness is the essence of prayer. Helplessness is the essence of prayer. Look at, um, when you come to God in prayer, it should be an immediate recognition that your capabilities fall short in some way. Why else would you pray? I mean, right? You pray. Like, and most of us come with our grocery list for God, right? God, let me win the lottery today. God, let me get the job. God, let me get the house. God, let me get the girl. God, let me get the guy. God, let me get the promotion. Right? It's a laundry list. God, I need a car. We just have that. Like, God's a genie to us. And not that God doesn't want us to bring us. Like, I'm not. God wants us to bring those wants to us. But we come to him because Why? We don't know how else we're going to get it, right? I need a car, God. I have no money. I'm working as hard as I can. I don't see a raise or bonuses or anything coming anytime soon. So I need your help now. You have to intervene or I'm not going to get a car, right? God, I'm sick. The doctors are trying everything they can. Nothing seems to be working, right? I don't know. I've changed my diet. I've done everything I can do. I'm taking essential oils and juice plus and everything else there is to take. You know, I don't, it's still not working. Like, I know what they all say, but it's not helping me, right? So, God, I now need you to intervene. Helplessness is the essence of prayer. Why? Because we come to God and we ask someone else to intervene in our lives. Because there's something that at some point we all recognize we can't do it. You know, many, many people criticize Christianity. They criticize that you believe in God at all, right? They say that belief in God, prayer, it's all just a crutch for those who are too weak. Like it's a crutch for the weak-minded, a, a crutch for the weak-bodied, a crutch for the uneducated. And you know what I say to that? I say right on. That's exactly what it is is yep. it's a crutch you know why because i need a crutch in my life Amen. because my life is a wreck yep. my life i fall short I, I fell short this morning like this morning i said something really stupid to my wife sorry babe i said something <laughs> really stupid to my wife this morning and i'm like god i need you to help me watch my mouth i need the crutch and anyone who tells you they don't is lying they're not being, the, the scariest thing about it is they're not being honest with themselves. And you can't be honest before God before you're honest with yourself. 
God just wants us to be honest. And in fact, I, I think what we see, and look, let's look at verse 21 and 24. This is exactly what it looks like. Look at the exchange between Jesus and his father. It says this. How long has this been happening to him, Jesus asked the father. From childhood, he said. And many times it has thrown him into the fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. There's the helplessness. If you can do anything, please just do it. I can't do it. Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. You can almost hear the desperation in the father's voice in verse 22. We need to come to God with that same sense of desperation. We need to be desperate for God to intervene in our lives. Why wouldn't we want the God of the universe to intervene? What, what could possibly go wrong with that? Why is that not a good thing? I know why I think it's not a good thing sometimes, because I like to be in control. And so sometimes I'm like, well, if I ask God to do it, he's going to do it his way, and he's not going to do it Eric's way. And if he's not going to do it Eric's way, then I don't know if I want it done at all. Right? That's the way it is. But why would we not want the God of the universe to intervene? Prayer is when we get to the end of our rope, and then we realize that God is the only one who holds more rope. That's what prayer actually is. And we see that we're helpless. In fact, the last thing, the final point is this. We need to recognize the full extent of our helplessness. So God sees our helplessness. Helplessness is the very essence of prayer. And finally, we need to recognize the full extent of your helplessness. Look at verse 24. Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Look, the father said, yeah, I believe. I do. I really do. But I know that I could, that I should believe more. I just don't know how. He recognized his inability even to have complete control over his beliefs. Like, I don't think we understand how helpless we actually are. About how small and infinitesimal we are in the scope of the universe. About how powerless our lives can be. And I'm really not trying to be a doubter to you. I just want you to recognize the full picture. That because we are so small and God is so big, He can do something really great and mighty in your life if you'll just let Him do it. If you'll just say, yeah, I'm going to be honest. You know what Jesus can't stand? Jesus can't stand the lying, the hypocrisy. That's one thing that Jesus never had any tolerance for whatsoever. He can deal with your unbelief. If you have just a little bit of belief, He can take that and he can grow. He can deal with your helplessness. He's fine. That's what he's there for. What did he tell Paul? Paul had like some kind of thorn in the flesh. Something that was bothering him over and over again. And Paul said three times, I asked God to take this away from me. I can't do it. And what did God say? He said, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You know, when this father told Jesus, he said, you know, I believe, help my unbelief. Did Jesus say, well... You know what? You need to get that sorted out. Until then, we're not going any further with this. I'm just, I'm not going to, did he do that? Did he walk away? No, he took what little belief the man had, and he used it, and then he multiplied it. How much belief do you think that man had after his son was miraculously healed? How much do you think it would grow? When God answers a prayer, how much does your faith grow? God takes your helplessness and he uses it to show who he is in your life and the life of the people around you. And then he takes that and he grows your faith and he grows your belief time after time after time again. He takes our helplessness and turns it into reliance on him. And that reliance is connected to his great power. God wants to change your life through prayer. But you have to be willing to humble yourself enough to say, God, I really do need you. So my question is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to pray that prayer? Are you willing to come face to face with the parts of you that may, you may not like to see? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. You know, we're getting ready to take the, the Lord's Supper here. And the Lord's Supper is a symbol of our reliance on what Jesus did on the cross for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was spilled for the forgiveness 
of our sins. I don't think there's anything that we can do other than baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's just an outward symbol of our reliance on Jesus Christ. Now, we could live a life of reliance every single day. And that's what I hope we do. That's, that's the purpose of Watershed Church is to make disciples to make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is someone who looks to someone else and relies on them for their direction and for how they should live their life. And that's what we want. We want to rely on God for our direction and for how we should live our life each and every day. And the Lord's Supper is just an, an outward expression of what God's doing in and through our lives. So as we begin to pray to thank the Lord's Supper, I want to invite you to, to take some time to do some self-reflection before God. And you, when you get saved, you just kind of play a little bit. We believe that the Lord's Supper is for those who have been born again. Let me just say that. Those who have admitted their helplessness before God, admitted that, hey, yeah, I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. And I can't do anything to save myself from my sin. I'm helpless in that area. I can try to be good, but the sin's already been committed. And so I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ that he is God's son. That he died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. And that God rose him from the dead three days later. So, if you believe that, if you believe that in your life, and the Lord suffers for you, we invite you to participate in that. You don't have to be a member of this church. It can be the first time you've ever walked in here. That's fine. We invite you. But you've got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And he has to be your Lord and Savior. You have to be committed to following him. We also believe that it's for those who are walking in the obedience of being baptized after they are born again. So if you've done that, we invite you to participate with us. I don't care where you've gone to church before. I don't care what class you've been to. I don't care about any of that. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Now, the other thing that I would ask is that you take a moment right now. Let's just go ahead and, and bow your head and close your eyes. Uh, you don't have to. Like I said, you can talk to God with your eyes open, but sometimes I hope it, helps, I, I, it helps me focus. But take a moment right now and deal with with any unconfessed sin in your life. I, I ask God, God, is there anything in my life, any sin that I need to confess to you and ask for your forgiveness? The Bible tells us that we should repent and ask God's forgiveness before we take communion, before we take the Lord's Supper. So just, I'm going to give us just a moment of silence. I'm going to be quiet. And just do business with God. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you want to do that. Maybe start that conversation with God during this moment. Just for about 30 seconds, it's bright.